The British Council Library presents In Conversation with Ranul Tanthilage. Though our guest is a PhD researcher working in Ireland for the Insights Center of Data Analytics at University College Dublin, working mostly with technology as his research interests extends across digital forensics, cybercrime investigation, and big data analytics. We have persuaded him to share with us not his passion for all things cyber, but instead his other great passion, wildlife, its photography and its conservation. But of course, if we do have time, we can ask him some IT questions too. But you must feel free to put any questions and comments you have in the public chat, and I will pick them up in the Q&A session. So as you will see, Ranul has expanded his roots in several work sectors. His love for the fauna and flora, initially inspired by family roots, led him to wildlife photography and videography. He is a commercial drone controller and specialized in aerial filming within the national parks. He was the creative director for Wild Asia TV series in Sri Lanka. This made him spend most of his young life close to nature. He has several awards and publications to his credit. Ranul, I would really, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Hi, British Anna. Council Library. Hi, and th thank you thank for you accepting Anna. our invitation. Hi, and Hi, agreeing to see, I'm good, I'm good. I'm looking forward to this because it, you have been very generous to give up your time and to share your interest with us. So we are looking forward to you, what, what your presentation actually, and maybe some videos that you have to share. Yes, definitely. So, um, Okay, so don't forget to put your questions and comments in the chat. And over to you, Rano. Thank you, Mirali. So yeah, uh, first uh, I would show a small presentation and uh, let's wait till that comes up on the screen. Okay, uh, so basically this is a question that uh, I want you guys to think throughout this small one hour session. Have you contributed towards the fauna and flora? Can be in Sri Lanka or can be anywhere. So uh, when it comes to fauna and flora in Sri Lanka, this is just some small fact sheets that I found from the National Red List uh, 2012. There are 125 mammals, 240 resident birds, uh, around 1,377 marine fish, 250 around land snails. I mean, these are facts that we usually don't know. So if you check the national red list, you can find quite a number of facts, even more than this. And when it comes to protected areas in Sri Lanka, uh, there's one elephant corridor and three strict nature reserves, seven nature reserves, 26 national parks and 61 sanctuaries, according to the Wildlife Conservation Department. And when it comes to me, uh, these are basically the national parks I've visited. Uh, starts from Yala, Vilpattu, Galloya. Yala East, which is known as Kumana, Udawalava, uh, Lahugala, Madhuroya, Vaskamua, and so on, up till Pigeon Island. So that's around, I guess, around 14 bucks. So uh, the main reason why I got the chance to, or why I wanted to visit all these parks in the, the few years time. So I had a great passion and love for the fauna and flora in Sri Lanka, as well as in general, fauna and flora everywhere. And I wanted a break from the busy city life. And I always have a passion to drive off-road and for work and career because I was involved with the TV series called Wild Asia. And uh, because of that, uh, I worked as a drone controller, videographer, photographer, as well as a creative director for the program. And for the peace of mind, because staying with the fauna and flora is something that I love the most. It's keeping technology apart and aside, staying with the uh, fauna and flora really relaxes your mind and keeps your problems away and family of course because uh, my parents are involved with uh, the same tv series as directors so uh, my entire family is into wildlife filming so yes i got the chance because of family as well and uh, i'll speak a bit about wild asia this is uh, the main reason that i was involved in the wildlife it was a documentary series that uh, focused on changing people's minds into loving the fauna and flora and showing that they are kind of our friends and we acted as a media team for the while. So we reported incidents that happened last and fade off. So that was the main theme of the program. 
it telecasted over 400 plus uh, episodes in Sri Lanka. And at current, we actually hold the largest video library of Sri Lankan fauna and flora, including wildlife on the ground, as well as marine life all around Sri Lanka as well. So uh, my contribution to Wild Asia was as a creative director and uh, drone and aerial videographer and a photographer as well. So basically, I was the first uh, person to start drone photography commercially in Sri Lanka. And this was the first drone that uh, actually was brought in Sri Lanka in, I think, just right after the war. So this was a Phantom 1 with the GoPro. It had no sensors like the modern drones, uh, no automated flight paths. And uh, I mean, nowadays, a drone can fly for around 25, 30 minutes. But this, we had to change batteries every 10 minutes. So we have to make sure that we know what shot that we need to take and get it back down and go for the next shot with the next battery. And very weak video signals because uh, this was an entry because that was Phantom One was an entry level DJI drone that was uh, since it was many years back, and that's what we had to work with because that's how I started off as well. And it was completely up to the controller to on which image to take and how to take it because it's like it's not like all the automated drones that come up now. It was way tougher than that. And uh, these are some work snaps that I just wanted to share, getting stuck, uh, going here and there, and uh, basically carrying the drones. Uh, we had different mechanisms of wildlife kind of ways, wild ways of carrying stuff as well. And moving on to the next, uh, I think we can enjoy a bird's eye view of some of the national parks in Sri Lanka so, so that everyone can enjoy that. And I think we can play that next. Uh, the aerial footage of the six minutes, the other way. Uh, no. Yep, that's the one. So this is Yala National Park starting off with sunrise at uh, Butava. And that is Akasa Chaite. It is uh, a small temple, a historic kind of place uh, that you see. Okay. This is Jamburagale. If someone has been to Yala, definitely yes, you would have seen this. Uh, some wild buffaloes at Villapalagava Lake. This is uh, at Mahasi Lava, the sand dunes at Mahasi Lava. Rocks at Butava with the thing. This is during the drought period, uh, Darshanagava. That's Patangala, the one of the most popular places that people can get down at Yala. Next is Pandi Kema. Yes, quite popular for sloth bears. And moving on to block two, it's mostly like deserted land. This is Miniagal Kanda Hill. And this is mostly like a thorn kind of forest at uh, Katupilara. A herd of elephants, a small herd. And this is Kumbu Kangoy. On the left, actually, you can see uh, the Kumana National Park, and on the right, Yala National Park. It's the separation of the park. This is Udavalava and uh, just a family of elephants. Best thing is, I mean, even if though it's filmed with a the drone, they don't show much movement. They stay in their natural environment. Here, you can actually uh, see how much discipline and order they follow because they go one behind the other and on the exact path as the leader.
This is the popular river to the Valava, where the name comes as well. It's Valave River. This is the remains of a she-elephant that passed away closer to Konkatuara. And this is the Mauara Reservoir and the flock of pelicans. This is Galloya. The savanna forest. The speciality of a savanna forest is the trees are placed uh, not closer to each other but far away, far apart. This is the popular Makare because uh, the river goes inside and then comes up. The Senanaika Samutra. And uh, main area, this is the bamboo forest area. And the main area is wire. Minneri is home to the largest number of elephants in Sri Lanka. Minneri and Kaudulla, you can see hundreds and of elephants. This is Boondala, and on the left, on the top, is the salt marshes that you see. I think we can see a closer shot of that as well. And the sand dunes at Bundala. It's really cool to drive on this. And Vilpattu National Park. It's home to the most number of lakes, I think. And the name comes from the lakes. Vil means lakes. So we saw Kokkaria, Kumbuk Lake, and this is Kudapatasa. And next is Nelum Lake. Comes from the name comes from the so much lotus flower. That we see. This is Kali Vilva, closer to where in our history that Kueni plucked uh, cotton buds. This is Tambapanni, where King Vijay is assumed to have got down to Sri Lanka from. And there have been some kind of a lighthouse kind of thing at here as well. The cliffs at uh, Kudiramale Point. And these are some little comorant birds, also known in single as deer covers. So hope you actually enjoyed the video. It was some footage of a few national parks that I captured here. And uh, next, we can look at how, what kind of impact actually uh, the fauna and flora has on a person. So basically, I would say that for me, it would be a lot of peace of mind and uh, reduce stress, definitely. And uh, it makes us calm and also an out of the box kind of thinker because with the nature, we experience a lot of things and uh, we have to find solutions that we can't Google always. So yeah, and we learn to take risks. I learned that to be a risk taker from being in the wild mostly. And we are open to try out new concepts because uh, we, when we are in the wild in a national park, we don't know what the next step or the next minute would bring us, right? So we definitely have to try out new concepts, take new risks, and so on. And uh, moving next is the challenges and the experience that I've faced. So once I remember one of the steering boxes of a vehicle breaking down at around one one day's drive. So that's even if, if it's 40 kilometers on a rainy season with all the mud in block two, it will take more than one day to get from one place to another and when a vehicle breakdowns it's completely havoc i've had issues where drones malfunction uh, not only in yala but even in other places uh, sometimes i mean since it's when i started off it we didn't have any new drone capabilities because it was the first series of drones and because of that we had so much of issues like um, them just uh, malfunctioning uh, not responding and issues like that and uh, 
the other fact is that the challenge is we ha don't have telecom signal much like not like the mobile communication providers uh, have signal on the on yala just after block one all the signal in would go off and uh, so we we depend on citizen band cb radios and the uhf transmission and we, we when we usually go for filming we stay like 10 15 or more days at a stretch so we have to find food for us humans plus the fuel for the vehicles as well so we have to carry a whole load of stuff and animal attacks definitely uh, allergies and stuff like that and we definitely one thing in uh, especially not like going to visit the nature but uh, when we go to film the wildlife we have to blend in them with them right to get the best shot out we have to maybe spend their hours or days so that the animals know that we are no harm to them so that we can blend in that's kind of the most important and uh, moving on i think i can show you some a small short trailer of wild Asia as well because uh, earlier i showed you the aerial footage but this is just like a 30 second uh, just some footage that we have captured off. So yeah, actually that brings me to the end of the videos. Uh, but I could say uh, what I enjoy, uh, especially spending time with uh, fauna and flora, wildlife photography, videography, off-roading, outdoors, adventure. And uh, that actually made me initiate uh, ATV Adventure Center in Sri Lanka as well. It's called uh, Crate Adventure. You guys could check it out and author in books as well as research publications. When I was uh, really young, I think around 15 or 16, I ordered a small book called uh, ASEAN Wally, uh, Asian Elephants for, uh, it was aimed for young readers. So it was a very small book, but even youngsters who watch this, you know, you could try out things like that. And yes, uh, the technological side, I'm interested in that side as well. And uh, so this, this slide is basically for any young audience that is watching this, how can youngsters enjoy while protecting the fauna and flora? So main concept, love it. And you have to start it small and start at home start at home start saving or protecting from the smallest creature like if you can save a silly plant save it that's how i came into it and uh, always think as animals as friends and family because they also have to feel pain like if one animal is killed of course they would have siblings or whatnot who would miss them and also they do uh, feel pain and Always speak up if you see your parents or anyone, your elders or anyone doing a mistake, your friends harming the environment, the fauna and flora, always show them that this is wrong and so that they can correct it. And something I enjoy when you see in uh, the wild, click a shot, draw, record, sounds of nature, anything that you enjoy. Like I, I enjoy taking, I, I don't like drawing, but I take, I enjoy taking photographs. So I did that. In the same way, if you like drawing, you can do that. You can record sounds if you're interested in listening and bird watching and stuff like that. And my last statement would be protect the nature and it will definitely give back to you. Trust me, it has given back to me so many for the past so many years and it will do it for you as well. And thank you. And I think uh, Rinali, we can move on to the Q&A. And if any chance uh, you guys need to reach me on LinkedIn, Instagram, or my emails. And thank you, and ho I hope you enjoyed the videos as well as uh, the short presentation. So um, I'm going to start from where you left off. I would like to know specifics of what, what this whole experience has given back to you. You said it gave you a lot of things. What in particular would be the most treasured thing it has given you, this involvement? Um, I think the most treasured would be it allows me to be calm and to solve problems. Like, I think 10 years back, if I get a problem, I would panic and, you know, um, or get 
too angry or something like that but now i'm more calm whatever that comes on my way i i really don't mind about things much because i take it the calm way so i think that's what it has taught me most to solve problems in a calm calm a solid way okay so that takes me on to i i want to know one of your adventures that you had something that didn't go right and how you dealt with it in the wild because i think there are lots of uncontrollable unknown variables in the wild so what what really went badly wrong and how did you overcome it i actually remember once uh, we started off in yala through block 1 block 2 and uh, crossed the kumbukkang way to go to uh, kumana and mm -hmm. uh, that is yala east yeah and uh, then halfway i you know there are like really large mud holes in uh, places like yala called mm -hmm. ara ara i'm not sure of the english word i don't think there's a specific english word for that huge mud hole that you have to do winch in and everything to get out so okay. uh, i it was the rainy season so when i got down there was water to around uh, let's say around my knee or above and uh, we had to get down and make sure that the path is clear and so on and uh, something bit me i don't know what and uh, I, i because it was inside the water and not like i could see or i could touch so i came out and my leg in like uh, two or three hours time was about this much it was huge both my legs and i had to stick with it uh, with for the next few days i took uh, i had few tablets different different things that i could take and uh, somehow it went okay and also once uh, I I got kind of like an um, I stayed next to a remains of a deer and uh, the smell or something caused some kind of virus or something for me uh, which uh, which I had to end up in uh, hospital for like 5 6 days but that was fine because uh, I mean I enjoyed the time so just a few days off is quite all right I I really don't mind of those stuff now Yeah but I mean it's So your your leg you had an allergic reaction to something in the water was that it I don't know whether it was an allergic reaction it was something that bit me I think maybe poisonous I don't know So I mean it you know because... down... yeah. Sorry? So it went, yeah it went down in few days like 4 5 days so that was fine Okay so for 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 people um mainly raised in cities and in towns and sort of in fairly urban areas what are the best tips that you can give when when they go out into the wildlife you know or oh, how should they behave what should they take what precautions i, I like when you were shooting wild asia were, you, were there any specific protocols that you all followed yes i mean see it's filming for wild asia was quite different than the other you know the tourist or the visitor that goes to a national park because uh, we had different ways of filming that we did uh, from vehicles drones cameras that uh, we put inside uh, holes of burrows of animals cameras that we mount and keep overnight and different different mechanisms that we use so we i mean as a visitor going to a national park they would stick to uh, their own vehicle or or the hired jeep or suv that they use and they will get down at designated areas only so i don't think they'll come across these issues because uh, it's not like they are doing it commercially or for filming purposes so because they'll have their own protocols that they'll have to follow but for us uh, because we are already used with the wild i think uh, it was much easier like even a small animal by not like anyone in our team would mind that much and we always to cover tablets or whatever allergic allergic tablets but nowadays i think i've heard that there are uh, even for insect bites there are small devices that if a person can take uh, which if you like if an insect bites here they can inject and take the venom out instantly i've never tried it but i have heard that there are things like that i've seen so uh, i think Uh, the best thing if you if a person is living the city life is going to a national park or the wild the best would be to consult their doctor and know what their allergies are and get the proper medication so that you don't uh, get in trouble but that's not necessary if you're just going as a visitor just for a few hours or like one day that's not necessary and if you're going on a overnight kind of expedition yes then that's necessary okay because i mean I... there's a lot of footage of leopards being run over and you know all that 
that kind of very sad to see. So you wonder how do these things happen? You know, I mean, if you're careful, then you know you can't have accidents like that. So it's something I mean, that. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, people are careful. I mean, the thing is, what I understand is. Uh, what i believe is the animals are more disciplined than us humans to be honest like uh, whenever i have seen like i've seen like 400 500 jeeps in yala at the same location so that's a very tough scenario to deal with and uh, when they move i mean just 500 vehicles at one location 500 plus vehicles at one location just think uh, it, there can be accidents and stuff that can be caused right because not like it's one or two vehicles at a location going on to the same animal, focusing on the same animal. But at those instances, there are problems that arise. But I mean, of course, yes, you have to be careful that you don't harm the nature going to uh, visit it or enjoy it, right? And you said you chose, I, I thank you for sharing the aerial photography. No. It's, it's something very special to see, you know, because Mostly you see wildlife as a still photograph or like yeah. taken from the land, but this was magical almost. I mean, you look at it and you think, is this Sri Lanka? It's so beautiful. And yeah, I, such a diversity. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, I think uh, these are the only aerial footages that you could see on Sri Lankan national parks because to my knowledge, I was the only one who was allowed to film inside as well. Okay, because the I mean even the will part to the the will lose, it's beautiful yeah. to see that sort of even the shape of them, you don't really yeah. see it from the ground as such. Like if but, you take it way above, you can see like dots and dots of wheels. It's it's huge, just just lakes and lakes. And what was your favorite park? Where did you enjoy shooting most? Where do you go back to over and I over again? Uh, I think Vilpatu is nice because it's peaceful. Not too many humans go there. I mean, too, not too many people go there. But Yala is packed with tourists, and just Yala Block One is like Colombo, worse than Colombo to be honest. Uh, on a busy summer day, and uh, if not, I would prefer some place like Horton Plains because it's good to be lazy, cozy, and you know, comfortable with the nice weather, and you know, have a little nice nap. I think Cotton Plains is more preferable for me. So have you seen, um, I, I know there was a report out uh, with the endangered list. Have you seen a lot of those species? Have you encountered them in your photography? Yes, Some of I, even leopards are endangered, right? I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. OK. But uh, there, there, have, there have been many instances, yes, definitely. And any new species that you came across? Not when you have a shooting for wildlife. It's definitely okay. a species that's known in Sri Lanka. Okay. All right. No, and I also so do you use hide photography? I, I mean I learned I read up on this. It's you know where you build a little hide and you sit in it for days and days and sort of you wait for the animals to come and go past it kind of. Did you all do that kind of yeah. I mean do yeah. they do that kind uh, of we, thing here? Yes, we do hide photography, it's more like a camouflage photography. But it's not okay. that uh, yeah. we, any one of our team members would sit there for the entire day or two. But we would basically set up a remote controlled camera or a full time recording camera or a motion sensor camera and let it do the job camouflage. Because uh, the best thing is, I mean, just a camera would take up little space, but with a human and everything, camouflage would be much larger. And, even the creatures would uh, definitely sense it on their smell. So it's, even sometimes when you have the cameras, we have noticed like uh, if we have touched it and if our smell or the scent is there much, uh, they just, if elephant comes close, they'll just take the camera and throw it away. Uh, we have so, recorded it just like that, which has happened. So sometimes it's a lock of the camera as well. Oh my goodness. So you, you have to then wipe down equipment that you're going to leave. I mean, uh, is there special things you have to do when you do wildlife photography like this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, wiping down or just spraying with some just uh, wild kind of scent or there are specific things that you could spray or, you know, okay, stuff like that. Just make sure that the human scent is not there and then that's fine. 
Okay. Um, there are some comments. Um, yeah. But mostly people are talking about trees that have that, that we need to grow trees. So um, I mean that's that's a given, right? I mean, yeah, what definitely. if this, yeah? But I mean, uh, there's some of the forest cover that you showed. There was such a diversity again. I mean, I didn't know that we had like a savanna sort of forest in yeah, Sri Lanka. So where is the savanna forest? In that's closer to Galloway. In oh, okay. the far side. Okay. Eastern All side right. And then you talked about bamboo. I mean, it, it went past very quickly, and I made a note to ask you, where was the bamboo? You said something uh, about bamboo, and then you said yeah. that is that Minaria National Park, if I remember right. Oh. Have you been to so, Yala Block 4? People talk about Yala Block 4. Have you yeah, done any I shooting block, there? I have been to Block 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, I think, yes. Yeah, but did you all do any shooting uh, in Block 4? Uh, it's very hard to find animals uh, in block four, to be honest, because it's dense forest. Oh, okay. For shooting, I would say the best is block one, because mm -hmm. the animals are quite used to the vehicles and quite used to, you know, have off created by humans because many people visit that. So it's quite easier because they already have, they already know it. But in block uh, two, also it's very huge, but very less forest cover. Because it's mainly like I, I think I, there were a few aerial visuals as well. And there are not much roads that you can use in block two, three, four, and five. Because of that, uh, you can't really access all the locations unless you go on foot. Okay. So, so block one, there are the, the road network is very good and the animals are used to the humans and it's much easier to shoot. If you're going for filming or shooting photographs, that is much convenient. Hmm. And talking about the photographs i mean you were saying that it was fashionable to use helicopters to do photography at that time people were not really exploring the drone option so what made you think of this whole drone and using that technology Actually, i know you yeah so we wanted to show something different like we had a huge viewership for wild asia and we wanted to bring out some, some like a different kind of image like how then we thought of a bird's eye view like how the bird basically sees the parks or the forest. And then we were thinking of uh, getting, hiring helicopters, you know, sending a filming team, low flying helicopters or something like that. But then at that time, when we checked that out, you know, the noise levels created would definitely be not suitable for a national park and the animals would not definitely react in their natural habitat, right? Because uh, it's like, even, even in the sea, if a, in Colombo, a helicopter goes and we'll definitely look at it and yes, then our natural habitat would be destroyed. So then uh, we were checking on other mechanisms of getting the same visuals and then drones came up to mind. And uh, But even in the world at that time, drones were were very limited usage. I mean, it's, nowadays you see drones everywhere and you know, problems with drones, drones crashing here and there. It's so much of drones everywhere, right? You can, I have seen drones the size of the farm. Uh, you use drones for food delivery and whatnot. But at that time, drones were at the entry level. And uh, so we tried different uh, drones. And I think I remember there was a few hexacopters and uh, then there was a quadcopter called Parrot, if I remember right. And then there was DJI with uh, the Phantom. So I think uh, we... we check the technical specs of everything and uh, phantom kind of suited us the most and uh, but it was it was a huge device to carry here and there especially when we are going on foot because nowadays you get backpacks and easy carry devices but those days i think there was one picture in the presentation where we had to put a pole across to people and you had to carry the drone like that because it was a huge box that came up with it and yeah so we had to go on with that kind of work because it's the entry stage and how long how long would you be out in the jungle doing this kind of shooting and pro, for for what you know for one of the programs? So or the minimum. Would it, yeah, go ahead, please. No, would it just depend on did y'all did y'all have a set time that y'all would spend in the jungles? No, it's usually minimum ten days, and uh, it will go for around two to three weeks. So at least ten days to. 2, 5, 10, 15, 18 days, something like that. But minimum is 10 days. We usually always stay more than 10. 
So you you camp in the jungle, is it? Uh, we camp or we the, in some national parks you get bungalows. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we usually prefer the bungalows to be honest because uh, it's a hectic day at work and everything. And if we can come to you know a proper bed and rest, it's much preferable for us. Okay. Um, we have some. What do you think about too much of visitors entering the park and causing disturbances for wildlife? It's definitely wrong. I mean, come on, it's their national park, right? It's, it's not ours. It's so the city is ours, but the national parks are the animals, the fauna and the flora. So definitely, they should we should allow them to stay at peace, and uh, that's the main reason I say like uh, when you see 500, 500, 400, 500 plus vehicles at one location going behind uh, one leopard, that's just how it's definitely not right. There should be limitations or so put on so that the animals can live in their natural habitat without being disturbed. Plus, the people can enjoy it as well. This is the big conversation, actually, that's going on, isn't it? I mean, yeah. about the, finding that balance between what's good for their nature and what's good for human beings and finding it's, 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 it's a tough conversation and a lot of people are having it. But um, I mean, hopefully, I mean, we will all come to some kind of consensus and resolution on it before, you know, too much stress has been caused to the animals. And uh, this, this person also asks, aren't drones prohibited for use with the current national security crisis? How did you manage to overcome this? Actually, uh, I use drones at the early stages, and uh, it depends on who uses it and for what you use it. And we have special permits uh, given by the defense and uh, definitely by wildlife departments and so on. Whichever yes. place that we fly, we have to take a permit accordingly. And they, they are people always supervise whether everything is up to standard and so on. So, yeah. Yeah, I was assuming you couldn't just walk in there with any old. Definitely people. not. And yeah. in national parks, unless you have a very solid reason you are not allowed to and unless you're very yeah, they they basically know that you are well fully trained to fly inside a national park without harming the any wildlife or anything they would not allow it so you got started out on this because your parents were involved in in wildlife and conservation and photography and all of that yes um but if you have parents who are not interested in any of this and you still want to be involved, what advice could you give somebody like that? What could they do? How make could they access some of these things? Basically make your family interested in that. <laughs> that's, <laughs> <what I'm saying. laughs> yeah. that's too easy an answer. But I mean, I, I love the way you said, take care of even the smallest creature that you meet, even an ant. I mean, if, if you start showing respect at that level, then obviously, you know, you, you become your, your sense of awareness and care and consciousness increases. So, but um, I, I, I can imagine that there are lots of children out there who must be yearning to get out and see things, but it must be very difficult. Um, maybe this is a controversial question, but do you think a zoo is a good place? No, definitely not. Seeing animals in cages makes us learn nothing. I, I actually have visited only the Dehivala Zoo, I think, just once. That was when I was around five, six years old, and I've never been there again. OK, but even from a conservation perspective, you still don't think it's a good idea? I mean, what what kind of conservation can you see in a zoo? Because it, it's not animals that uh, who want to be left in those cages, especially at that stage, right? With such confined space. Like, for example, an elephant would walk kilometers or hundreds, thousands of kilometers in its lifespan. Like, like, lifespan. And uh, basically, in a zoo, what does it do? Just go here, there on a basically loop or square, doing nothing, right? That's yeah. not what the animals want. And would we like to stay in a cage? I don't think so, right? Uh, how much trouble we had when we, in the past COVID-19 quarantine period, during the curfew where we had to stuck, get stuck inside our houses or rooms or apartments. Definitely, we didn't enjoy that, right? So definitely, yeah. I don't think the animals would enjoy that either. Yeah, and we had more choice, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> OK, let me see. Uh, oh, somebody wants to know, does the black jaguar live in Yala National Park? I have never met 
it at the Yala National Park, but I've heard rumors that it lives mostly in the hilly areas of Sri Lanka. And uh, we have tried back at those days uh, to film the Black Lagoon, but we have we once noticed one on a very distant place, like uh, by, like on a plains, on the Horn Plains, and uh, by the distance. But other than that, we have never encountered it in close proximity. I don't know how uh, in the recent times the Black Jaguar was so popular. It, it came out everywhere, right? Even in peace states in, and where not. You have caught glimpses of it. It does exist. It does exist, yes. It exists, definitely, yes. But uh, not in Yala. I've never seen in Yala. I've only seen in the hill country as well, at Horn Plains. Oh, OK. And um, of. I'm, I'm sure every national park has a special feature. Would you just like to sort of tell us about sort of what you would consider special features of each national park? So basically, if you say Yala, I'd say go for Yala for leopards and bears, but uh, keep aside uh, the trouble with all the vehicles and stuff. But uh, if you go during you know July, August, especially August and September, if it's open. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, of, you know, when there's very less water, the leopards always come to the water halls in the evenings to drink water, and there are very limited water halls, and you can definitely spot a leopard. And leopards and uh, slot bears are the most common in Yala, I'd say. Block two is popular for off-roaders more than animal lovers. And uh, block two is sorry, I didn't hear you, Rana. Yeah, block two is popular for off-roaders. Uh, off Okay. Driving rather than uh, mm -hmm. living animals because uh, that's mostly mud and stuff uh, during the rainy seasons. And uh, mm -hmm. Minneria, Kaudul, uh, those national parks are common for elephants. Mm -hmm. 100, 400 elephants can be seen at one go if you go in the right time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Vilpattu for the lakes, I'd say. And uh, you can do off roading without getting stuck that much in Vilpattu because the sand in all those places uh, in all those lakes that you have to cross in Vilpattu the bottom is basically sand and so you very rarely get stuck it's not like loose soil and mm. uh, what are the national parks uh, Horn Plains uh, and what Galloway what's what's the speciality in Galloway Ga Galloway uh, the speciality is the Makara Makare Makare is uh, yes. the river the, the Galloway comes and before it goes to the Senanaka Samudra there's a place mm. uh, like a um, dragon's mouth basically mm. that's why it's called Makare it mm. goes into that and it goes mm. from an underground tunnel and the water is not visible on the top and then it mm. comes up so people go to Galloway specifically to see that but in terms of uh, fauna, what do you see? I mean, is there a lot the of... Uh, the savanna forest is there, and uh, that's the most important, I think. And uh, other than that, I didn't see very... Uh, I mean, animal-wise, it's it's quite tough to see animals in those parks. So you go specific for specific reasons, like enjoying the savanna forest. I mean, not like you can experience that anywhere else. Okay, but you didn't you didn't say anything about my favorite place, Kumana. Oh yes, Kumana. Kumana is a. Uh, I think that's one of the best places to see wildlife peacefully, because you can see the basically you can see all the animals in Yala at Kumana as well, with very limited number of vehicles. Like you don't see like 400, 500 vehicles at one go in Kumana. So that's kind of like the best place uh, to view wildlife peacefully. I'd say. Yeah, and it's just uh, some amazing trees and foliage yeah. also. Yeah, so it's... Definitely. It's, yeah, because it's, it's, Yala tends to be more like shrub jungle and all, but Kumana yes. has magnificent trees. That's true. Um, let me see. Uh, and Kumana is quite popular for butterflies as well, if you go in the proper season. Like once I remember, uh, like we had to get down and, you know, make sure the butterflies go because it was spread out on the road. And if you drive, uh, basically, mm, yes. you just uh, kill them. So we had to get down and, and, you know, basically sweep and, you know, make sure they fly. And there are trees Isn't like Nila, especially the belly, I can't remember the name for that. And those trees are also quite common in those areas. These are the little yellow and white butterflies, right? It's like a cloud. Yes, 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 yes. yes.
they, they just go like like a basically like a piece of cloth that's spread out in the yes. pathway on the road i mean there's so much as you say beauty out there and yeah it is the best stress buster i think being able to get out to a place like that and just even if you even if you don't see any major wildlife or anything just the pleasure of the peace of the place um there is, have you seen community involvement or management in these national parks in your visits i'm not sure that community is allowed to be involved in 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 the national uh, park. no I, i yeah i think what the question states is like there are many community groups uh, who come in to clean and you know help and so on the only community engagement i've seen is mainly uh, you know there is uh, this time that uh, people cross through kumana to block to on foot the padayatra yeah yes, the padayatra yeah. so after that there are many community helpers forces who help, come to clean up everything i have seen mm. that mostly and other than that uh, there are community engagements uh, around the main office areas but i usually don't tend to stay around the main office areas much so because after we enter into the park it's very at, maybe we come back to the main office maybe like uh once a week or twice a week probably like that but yes okay. there there is a lot of community engagement okay um parksina they say according to your bad experience what may have bitten your leg <laughs> somebody I have no idea <laughs> i basically have no idea and uh, definitely it wasn't that poisonous because it didn't kill me and uh, anyways i i have this thing it's for me like even a small insect bites me my hand would go like this i, I that's okay. very common for me okay. like i i have okay. had instances where i hold the hand up not able to write uh, like for days just just by insect bite in colombo as well it's common for me good excuse, good excuse when you have exams <laughs> yeah <laughs> but nowadays i very rea- rarely write like i don't write anything so that's that's okay i mean i just I mean, we type everything in the laptop, right? So it's it's quite. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Yeah. Uh, somebody wants to know: Do pandas live in Yala National Park? Definitely not. You will have to go to China or Hong Kong. <laughs> Panda was actually my favorite animal when I was small, and I Why? went to Hong Kong to see it. I don't know. I like that, uh, you know, lazy guy, uh, lazy chubby, and you know, guy. We definitely liked it. Very cute looking. Yes. Yes. Very, very cute looking. Actually. Uh, once i went to hong kong uh, with my mom and uh, we went to well, i can't remember the park name there was a specific park in hong kong that had pandas and i loved it okay uh oh somebody says what about bundala uh, significance is it bird and butterfly birds yes bundala is common for birds and but i love bundala for a different reason the sand dunes and i love to drive on them so i would go to bundela not to enjoy the wildlife but just to drive on those sand dunes it's just so perfect but you don't disturb the wildlife when you're driving it must be very noisy no there there's basically no wildlife on the sand dunes it's it's just the sand it's just acres of sand okay uh somebody wants to know does a drone have a special remote control like that of remote remote controlled cars I don't know whether remote control are ah, you mean like remote control toy cars yes okay I was Must literally thinking right of the big remote big cars with a remote control no uh, yeah so there is a remote control on a drone definitely and there's a pitch adjuster and you usually get a screen and stuff to see the video and uh, basically drones have throttle rudder uh, speed and all those are there and yes everything is controlled by a remote controller I hope those have- Uh, Ranu has answered. That's pretty much all the questions that have come in on the chat. But I'm not okay. going to let you go just yet because I want to ask you about digital okay. forensics. Tell us a bit about. You know, this is so weird to me because this, on one side, it's the organic, it's all plants and wildlife and trees and nature and all that, and then there's very inorganic, very sort of mechanical, scientific. So. to me it's like two people almost so tell me about that interest uh i used to love computers from my childhood i mean my school friends would know that most mm. 
so i had different different likes i used to like astronomy at a start uh, i ended that and then yes while life was there it was running in the family blood i guess and uh, then it because this likeness that i had for computers maybe transformed into forensic side because i love to investigate on things not only on digital devices but basically i like to investigate on anything that i see like uh, you and i used i used to love to find new things or basically find how things happened so that basically led me into investigations and the forensic aspect of it but rather than become a naturalist you you chose this this career option or is it is it just a field of study and you might go back to what is no, it um, no my career would be in it that would okay. be my career and uh, my wildlife organic matter would be also a career actually because yeah. i work commercially and i get paid for it yes that's called a career then but uh, it's more like a career plus hobby that i like or love but definitely as my interest my research and whatever i study i will use it for my career ahead i won't i won't change or sides okay uh, there is another i'm going to take you back to the wildlife for a minute because somebody okay. wants to know have you assisted in any research through your drones for the conservation of wildlife uh there were instances where basically uh, officials like uh, from the departments they wanted uh, just you know uh, how just to see how things are they are like dude can you uh, just fly up and just check the shop and just show us i i have helped in little little things like that but uh, not in like in writing research or anything like that at that point but uh, basically when it comes to conservation yes everything that was done towards wild asia or that was done from wild asia was uh, basically to change people's minds into loving fauna and flora and basically reporting the incidents in the wild that happen and last and die off in the real way so that was basically conservation or making pe- making sure that people like conservation getting people used to conservation kind of thing. okay I'm going to talk a bit about the awards that you have to your credit. So in 2018 you were a member of the teams awarded the gold I think was it a gold medal by the British yes, Computer Society or the gold yes, award. Was, uh it was a gold award actually yes. Gold. Yeah. Uh by, by the British Computer Society the Chartered yeah. Institute for IT Sri Lanka section and you also had the you were part of the team for the second place in the A- Asia Pacific ICT Alliance. Yeah, Africa, yes. and this is for the sinhala braille character recognition and translation application of the ministry of defense yes yeah i was a consultant for the center for research and development uh, of the ministry of defense in sri lanka so basically at that time uh, we had a project uh, for braille character recognition and yes uh, i participated in that uh, and you and- also have an award uh, for volatile memory forensic software Yes. What uh, is volatile memory forensic software? It, yes. So basically, that came up with my bachelor's research and both my, I think even my master's research was quite focused in that area. Mm-hmm. So I had a tool which you know can analyze the volatile memory in a computer. Volatile memory is the RAM. So in, in okay. Simple terms, it's RAM. And uh, you could take a RAM dump of a computer system, and you could. Uh, my tool specialized in social media and you know instant messaging. so you can mm-hmm. basically analyze uh, what kind of uh, the chat history the password uh, the status updates tweets and emails and so on you could basically get a ram dump and put it inside my tool and get the report saying that this was the stuff that happened in the computer so something like that. yeah so even if it's an old old computer and you think you've cleaned it up and you chuck the machine there is no, still actually, even though no, you actually, delete it no the ram dump is for machines especially at investigations that are found live and online so this okay. so only machines that are currently running would have the current uh, where you can get a current ram, ram dump of the system like after you turn off the machine the ram completely destroys itself i mean it resets itself and 
refreshers at the next boot. And but nowadays, since many people tend to hibernate and do stuff like that, even the hibernate uh, dump file would be similar to the RAM dump, and we can analyze that as well from the same tool. Oh, okay. Wow. I mean, that's something. So, you think people should shut down their computers every single time and not kind of leave them in hibernation mode? Not really. I mean, see, when it comes from the forensics perspective, people shut down doesn't make a big difference. If you need to find something, you will find it at the end of the day, somehow. Like I did a research where, you know, you can uh, actually get the iPhone backups and uh, that was on online dating, e-dating applications and uh, where you can, uh, I actually submitted a conference paper for that as well in New Zealand. And uh, you can actually get the iPhone backup dump and uh, you can basically find all the people who were chatting with the e-dating applications like Bumble, Tinder, Coffee Meets Bagel and so on. It's actually quite uh, scary because you can actually find uh, the exact geolocation of the other person when where they stayed uh, when they first log in or sign up for the device, something like that. Even if they have not shared their location? Yes, because uh, in those applications to sign up, I think, to get which city you live, they always ask for your geolocation, GPS data. Okay. Um, I, there's a question about drones, which I'm not 100% sure what they're asking. Would you by any chance part with your knowledge to must be maneuver these drones in wildlife to the younger generation? Um, I think they're asking how whether you would sort of share with youngsters who want to operate drones and do the same thing you did on how to sort of maneuver them around in these sort of environments. Yeah, definitely. I mean, of course, I would like to share my knowledge and experiences as well. And uh, whatever it is, I mean, my only advice is uh, as long as you love it and you tend to research on uh, items. And nowadays with drones, it's so much easier than when I started because you have so many of sensors. Like the new DJI drones have sensors on the top, bottom, left, right, forward, front, and basically everywhere. And yeah. it's quite easier than uh, when I started because uh, you, if the drone loses vis like if i lose visibility of the drone like direct eye contact of the drone i would not know where it is and the signal video signal just gets cut out I mean, because those days there was the technology was way below like it was now it's here and those days it was way down so i mean i don't i am assuming this wasn't very long ago but technology has just gone through the roof i think it is just advanced yes. so in, in drones technology like every year it changed like huge amount like now they have visionary sensors but in the phantom one the gps didn't work sometimes <laughs> like like sometimes when you start the phantom one you have to hold it like uh, vertically like this and yeah. then you have to turn, yeah. turn it around and you have to do like this and then turn it around and just to get the gps signal stabilized the calibrated actually but now it's so much easier life is Actually, yeah, there's a lot of interest on drones out there. So yeah, I think I pretty much covered all these drone questions. Okay. Um, I'm, we are almost done, but I just want to ask, what is the future like for you? What are your plans? My plans change every minute, I'd say. Every, I would not plan for the next uh, few months. I, I never plan like that. Like, uh, for example, when COVID uh, came up, uh, I was in Ireland. I, in March, I was in Ireland, and uh, so my family and friends from Sri Lanka were like, uh, airport's closing down, aren't you going to come? I was like, of course, yes, now I have to come. And then I checked flights, and uh, there was one flight in three hours. Oh. I didn't take any, anything with me. I just booked the flight. I okay. had three laptops at that time. I took the three laptops and just one pair of clothes, nothing, no luggage, nothing, just one hand luggage, just and the hand luggage was considered there, and just came back here. So... Uh, all my stuff are actually, yeah. And no, I, would, I, I would mind like uh, shifting places here and there. That's common for me. I, I, I don't usually, as long as, like if I promised someone I would do something, I would definitely do it at that time because I have to be punctual on that. But other than that, if I'm free, if I don't have anything listed on my calendar, if it's, uh, then that's completely fine for me. Thank you, Ranul. It's been such a pleasure. And thank you for taking so much time on a Saturday afternoon. No worries. It has been 
really enjoyable talking to you. I hope our yeah. audience so yeah gains something from that. And thank you to everybody behind the scenes, especially Shamil and yes, to Shiroma. Yeah. Shamil and Shiroma did a great job, and Mirali, you too. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Ranul. Have a pleasant yeah, yeah. evening, everyone. Yeah, Goodbye. Nice Take care. Have a nice evening. Bye. Yeah. Bye.